Hello, I'm Erica Nisborski, your host for Behind the Lens. On our program, we talk with noted photographers about their work. And today, I'm pleased to have as my guest, Jeff Niveen. Welcome to Behind the Lens. Thank you. Good to be here. After getting a degree in cinema television from the University of Southern California, Jeff Niveen began to travel the world and discovered that travel and photography are made for each other. Photographically, Jeff tries to find unique perspectives that capture his experience and uses careful processing to capture the full tonal range of a scene. His work has been published in Washington, D.C. area newspapers and magazines, used in travel guides and on album covers, and will be featured at an exhibit at the Ratner Museum. Before we take a look at your work, I wanted to ask, how did you decide to become a photographer? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, I'm not sure that anybody really decides to become a photographer. Um, you don't wake up in the morning and just decide to start doing that. Um, I started taking pictures uh, when I was in college, and uh, it was a few years after that that people started saying, hey, you're pretty good, and people started to actually pay me for my work, so it was kind of a gradual thing. And what do you like to photograph? What, uh, what gets your attention? Um, well, I really enjoy travel. I think that gives you the biggest opportunity to photograph a lot of variety. Um, I enjoy landscapes. Uh, I enjoy urban scenes. Uh, I enjoy people. Um, pretty much anything that makes a particular place unique is, is what I want to photograph. And whose work do you admire the most? Well, um, I don't have a formal education in photography, so most of, most of what I do is just a product of of teaching myself how to do things. Um, I've got, now that I'm taking pictures, I, I go back and I look at Ansel Adams' work and that really speaks mm -hmm. to me. Uh, he really spent a lot of time composing a scene and capturing the full tonal range with the technology available to him at the time. He didn't have computers or, or stuff like yeah. that. Um, nowadays, uh, there's a lot of photographers on the internet who uh, inspire me. Uh, Trey Ratcliffe, for example, he was a, a, a pioneer in HDR processing and uh, he's somebody that I really looked up to when I was getting into it. And uh, what does photography give back to you? It allows me to capture my memories in a way that my own memory couldn't. Um, I'm a very visual person and when I'm traveling somewhere or if I'm with somebody um, I like to be able to capture it. My memory is not very good so I like to be able to refer to these pictures later on and experience these people and places all over again. You've brought some of your own photographs with you today. Let's take a look at some of them. Okay. The first photo that we have here are some birds. It's titled Birds on Sticks. Um, was this shot digitally or on film? Uh, this one was on film. Uh, this, was, uh, my, this was on my first big trip. Um, I was in New Zealand for a little while and it's an example of uh, uh, serendipitous subject matter. I certainly wasn't uh, traveling around the country looking for, you know, six uh, pillars of wood with birds sitting on each one of them. Uh, I turned around and they were there. Um, it was shot on film um, and it, w it needed to be shot quickly uh, because the fog was rolling in and uh, it was only a few seconds after this shot that you couldn't see anything anymore. It's nice. I like how the, the reflections um, of the sticks are, are represented in the water. Uh, it's mm -hmm. very painterly. It's nice. Thank you. Um, your next image is night sky in the outback. Um, how did you get this effect with the, was that just the sky or what was going on? Well that one was also serendipitous. Um, I had seen these long exposure uh, pictures of the stars in the sky uh, before and I wanted to do something like that. and. I was camping in the middle of the wilderness. There were no lights around. The sky was pitch black. Um, and I set my camera up on a tripod and I used a cable release to push the button down and I went to sleep. And I didn't know what I was looking at. I didn't know if the picture would come out. Um, the shutter stayed open for about six hours and I didn't know I had the shot until two weeks later when I developed my pictures. Um, it was complete luck that the horizon was where it was, complete luck that there were some trees to make it a little bit more interesting, and uh, complete luck that I captured the, south, the southern celestial pole in the sky around which all the stars are rotating. That's amazing. Um, your next image is where you start on the HDR. Mm -hmm. um, this one of the Brooklyn Bridge um, at night, 
How long is the exposure for this? I mean, it's several exposures, but how long are they? Well, with HDR, you have to pick something manageable uh, in the middle, and then you're going to shoot exposures that are even longer than that and then shorter than that. Uh, for this shot, the average exposure time uh, for each of my component HDR images is probably about five seconds or so. Mm -hmm. uh, you want to get it a little bit longer because you have the water in the shot and you want to kind of smooth it out a little bit. You know, even though the water is pretty flat in the photo, there are some waves, there are some ripples, there are some birds that kind of, you know, splash things around, so you want to try to smooth it out a little bit. And now you have a local image of the Jefferson in Washington. Um, is this, uh, this light here, this blue light, was that there or did you bring a flashlight? So one of the interesting things about HDR processing is that it allows you to capture the color of light uh, more effectively than you can with a single exposure. Uh, typically light is white. Uh, even if there's a slight color cast to it, um, if it's bright enough, your eye is going to interpret it as white. In this particular shot, I, I wanted to get the columns of the Jefferson Memorial. I, I also wanted to get the Washington Monument, but the light that was shining on both of them was a different color, and I had to choose which one to balance my photo on. I decided it would look most natural if I made the Washington Monument white and let the Jefferson Memorial take on that turquoise cast um, that the light was shining on. And we have another image um, with the Washington Monument in it, mm -hmm. uh, the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. Looks like it's just rained. What, how did you frame this image and get this idea? Well, the best thing about rain uh, in uh, public places is that it washes away the tourists. <laughs> um, I had uh, a, a big storm had just swept through D.C. and I wanted to get out and take some pictures because things look better when they're glistening after a fresh rain. And uh, in this case, I was walking down the path, and I saw the reflection of the tree in the sidewalk, and I did my best to capture it. Again, this is another example of how HDR can help you capture the full tonal range of a scene. Um, you can see some detail in the Washington Monument. It's not just a white stick, uh, but you also see all the detail in the Vietnam Veterans Memorial off to the left. That's nice, and again, you know, as I notice a theme here where you You've got water, and then you have the mirrored image in in the frame. That's very mm -hmm. nice. And um, we have Nationals Park with these really dramatic clouds in the scene. Looks like a storm's blowing in. Mm -hmm. um, how how long were the exposures for this one? Because it was much brighter. It was much brighter, and the exposures had to be relatively quick because the clouds were rolling in. Mm -hmm. um, if I remember correctly, the exposure there was maybe a second or so. Mm -hmm. um, also, the players are moving on the field and the fans are clapping and cheering. Um, so it was important to get that shot relatively quickly. Uh, another, something else that really brings out the drama in the sky is the wide angle lens. Um, this is probably shot at about 11 millimeters. Mm -hmm. So you get the full stadium and then the full, uh, you know, the clouds arching over the stadium in a way that you couldn't get with a, with a normal lens. And in your next image, we have uh, a dog, Peruvian hairless dog. How do you find working with HDR when you've got people and animals? It's really tricky to do portraits in HDR because obviously they're going to be moving in most yeah. cases. Um, and you have to do what you can to uh, capture their attention and keep them still uh, long enough to take your shot. Uh, animals and uh, young children are the same yeah. in that sense. Uh, you have to be the center of attention and you have to be entertaining. And if you can get them looking at you uh, for that split second and you're quick enough with the camera, you can get the shot. Now, with a shot like this, are you using a tripod or is this is handheld? This particular one was handheld. Um, and this particular dog was, uh, was, was aggressive towards me. Oh, no. um, I was actually backing up as I was taking the shot and the dog was stepping forward. And uh, again, you just needed to capture their attention and get them to calm down for a split second so you could get the photo. And then we have this boat, a rowboat, um, in your next shot. Looks like it's stuck on, the, on something here. Uh, mm -hmm. What was going on in this image? So this was actually an island made of reeds that was floating in a lake. Uh, there's a whole community in Peru uh, where, and they actually live on the lake and they build these islands by compressing reeds. And what that meant for me photographically is that it wasn't a stable surface. The whole island was actually rocking. Um, 
so I did use a tripod, um, but it was still very tricky, and I had to throw out a lot of my images because there was a lot of blur in that photo. Yeah, that's pretty incredible. Um, your next image here is titled Whispers. Um, you've got the human element in looks like minimal HDR usage here. Um, how did you frame this? Well, this was again uh, serendipitous. I didn't ask them to pose for me. Uh, I was walking by and I saw these two women chatting with each other, probably making fun of the tourists. Um, and I, I, I wanted to get the shot before they noticed me standing there because in most cases, uh, when somebody sees a large camera pointed in their direction, it's going to affect the way they present themselves. They're either going to ham it up for the camera or they're going to uh, be reclusive and shy and you're not going to get a natural looking shot. In this case, they were talking to each other and I turned around uh, and, and took the shot before they noticed. And we have another image with the human element. A lot of action going on. I can imagine that it must be very difficult to use HDR with all this action. Um, how did you manage to pull this one off? Again, uh, this was a matter of me uh, just walking across the street and turning and, and finding something that was interesting visually. Uh, the HDR helps capture some of the detail in the shadows. The man is, who's drinking the coffee is, is under an umbrella and there's obviously bright sun on the street. Uh, so technically uh, it helped me, but you're right, there, there were a lot of things moving and it was just lucky that everything was still enough for me to get the shot. And then we move into a much stiller frame, the Purple Lotus. Um, it's very sharp. What kind of lens were you using here? Uh, this particular shot was was probably uh, at, at 200 millimeters. Um, I, this was in Thailand. I did not have a macro lens with me. Um, I saw this wonderful flower and I just wanted to get a close-up shot of it. So I had to back up and uh, stand on a uh, railing and then zoom in to get the shot. And it's kind of a macro shot effect to it, but uh, the sharpness comes from the, I suppose the quality of the lens, but also uh, the, the HDR processing helps bring out all the detail in the leaf in the, uh, in the petals. Nice. And then we have um, these trees here. It almost looks black and white, but I see a little bit of color. It's very dark. Um, was this image shot at night? Uh, no, this was actually in the middle of the day. Uh, and it was a very deep and very dark forest. Um, again, I was driving along um, in Ireland. I saw these trees and it was, it was, there was such a simple beauty, beauty to it that I wanted to photograph it. Um, a lot of photographers say that the most beautiful things are the simplest things and that was the case here. I saw these stark white uh, trees and the deep blacks inside the forest and I wanted to try to capture it in the frame. And then we have the ongoing theme with the rain, the wet streets, the water, and we have cows and a wet road. Um, were they moving to cross the road or were they still in a pasture there? They were trying to uh, dry off after a big storm had come through. So you didn't see this coming necessarily? No, nope, no. Nope. This was just another case of a, of a storm coming through and, and washing away the people in the cars. and. Uh, it was just, it just worked. Storms are really good for cleaning things up, making things shiny, and, um, you know, clearing out the scene. Was this at about sunset? The sun was setting. Uh, you can start to see a little bit of pink in the clouds. Um, but I just, I just thought it was kind of a whimsical shot. Uh, there's a funny looking street sign on the left side. Uh, you have some cows hanging out on the right side and uh, a street that just goes off into the distance. And in your next shot, another uh, person here. Um, a lot of people have photographed women who are, look similar to this. Um, what made you take this image? Well, uh, this was a case of, of being brought to a community that was supposed to be authentic. Um, and this was a, a, a villager who lived in this community. And they were all doing very authentic looking things. and. I felt a little uncomfortable taking the shot.